Um, I'd like to take this time to introduce to you Dr. Michael Leonard. Dr. Leonard is a national physician leader for, the patient, safe, for patient safety at Kaiser Permanente, and he's a fac faculty member at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as well as a principal at Pascal Metrics, which is a safety consulting group. He is an anesthesiologist and um, has done some leading work in uh, patient safety, and in addition, in particular, writing a book on patient safety called The Essential Guide for Patient Safety Officers. So at this point, I just want to say how absolutely thrilled on behalf of the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative I, we are to be um, having uh, Dr. Leonard join us today and talk about safety culture and how we behave when no one's looking. So um, Dr. Leonard, I think I've, the technology is working. We'll pass it over to you. OK. Wonderful. Good morning, all. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about for about 20 minutes is why safety culture is important and, frankly, how to look at it, and then, which is really critically important, how to use that information uh, at a grassroots level at a clinical unit to, uh, frankly, drive improvements. If we think about organizations that really systematically drive superior safe care and efficiency, there's four or five basic elements. One which is not a fundamental issue for you guys, but frankly, sadly, sometimes in the States is, is superior safety and quality the actual core value of the organization? Is everything about the patient? If the care is patient-centric, not provider physician-centric, then it's much easier to align doing the right thing for the patient. Leadership is critical, and it's going to come up in our conversation around safety culture. I have to have senior leaders of the organization who say, this is who we are, this is where we're going, continually kind of beating the drum in the background to align the values of the, of the organization. What's critically important is to have leadership at a clinical unit level, nurses and doctors, we're willing to stand in front of their peers and say, this is important, we believe in this, we are going to do this. And that public commitment is absolutely key. We'll spend time talking about culture, and culture certainly relates to the team behaviors that have to be embedded within, <clears throat> within a clinical service line or a clinical unit to say, this is how we talk to each other, this is how we create an environment of psychological safety, this is how we brief, debrief, use checklists, et cetera. The last piece, last two pieces I would talk about are reliable processes of care. Do we have consistent processes, whether that's deep venous thrombosis prophylaxis or giving antibiotics or preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia or, or, you know, a process in the, in the ambulatory arena? But, but it's really critical to be able to do, deliver care consistently so that we have processes we can measure that we can improve because those become the template or kind of, shall we say, the framework for all the, the cultural pieces and the behaviors we're talking about. Last but not least, and, and we'll get into this, is the, the ability to debrief at the end of a shift, at the end of a procedure, and ask three questions. What did we do well? What did we learn? What do we want to do differently the next time? is this the ability to capture information and learn about those walk you know, those workarounds, those things that didn't happen, those frustrations, all those things that kind of get in the way of delivering optimal care. And that's really, really important, both for feedback and particularly in a very stressed kind of financial environment to be able to take waste and risk out of the system. Okay, so we spent a few minutes framing. Let's think about safety culture. It is you really want to measure safety culture at a clinical unit level, not across the organization, not across the hospital, because there's six times more variation at a unit level than there is across the walls of the building. You want at least a 60% response rate. That's statistically valid so that I could come back, you could come back next year and know that you're actually effectively measuring that population. You get 20 or 30%. One is you tend to bias toward the people that are noisy, and often they're not the happy folks. But, but in fact, you come back a year later and not even be asking questions of the same people. 
uh, 80 to 85 percent is a good target. In the, in the work we do in our group, we tend to average between about 75 to 85 percent response rates. There are a number of validated surveys, the two used primarily in the United States, Safety Attitudes Questionnaire that came out of the University of Texas, uh, the HRQ Westat survey, more recent, and then obviously you, you have uh, the modified Stanford survey uh, out of Accreditation Canada. So one is you have to administer well. Two, which we'll spend some time on, is how do you interpret this data that you can look broadly, but also take it down, drill it down to a clinical unit level, engage people. It's a very profound tool for cultural engagement. If I can walk into a unit full of doctors and nurses and, use, and show them their cultural data, then we immediately get away from, we're special, we're different, you must be talking about somebody else to, here's what you said. And that is a fundamentally different conversation. One, you know, kind of very, very kind of consistent um, rule that you have to have in feeding back cultural data is it's all framed to the positive. It's all about opportunity. It's here are the things you do well. Here are the things that we have opportunity or weakness that not only put the patient at risk, but put you at risk. What are the simple things we can do to make this better? It's all bottom up. It's all framed to the positive. What is a culture of safety? In my mind, it's an environment where everyone knows what the plan is, what we're trying to do for the patient who's entrusted their well-being to us. No one, zero, nobody is ever hesitant to voice a concern about a patient. And sadly, when you go in and ask very specific questions around that, you'll find 15, 20, 30, and sometimes higher percentages of people say, I would be hesitant to speak up, to have a voice. And that's not, that's just bad for everybody. It's dangerous for the patient. It, it generates the whole concept of moral distress for nurses and other caregivers. How often am I put in a position where the patient's at risk? How often am I put in a position where I'm at risk? And, and again, it's creating an environment of psychological safety and respect. Nursing input is well received. Voluntary personnel turnover is low. And we can show, we can demonstrate, we deliver high quality care. There are a number of comorbidities of poor safety culture. And it, you know, we have a long list here, but it's not good for patients. It's not good for staff. And I will show you some data that, that we're now starting to tease out that you can correlate actual clinical outcomes or the ability to deliver good care with positive safety cultures. So let me kind of illustrate why we want to look at unit levels, not hospitals. Here we're looking at several hospitals. And in fact, what do we see? Teamwork climate is ranging between 60 to 70 percent what are we going to do with that? Now, the, the way that I think about this, if we have a 100-point scale, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, OK, 100 points, I have 10 people in a room. If I have eight or more of those people at the green line that say it's good here, it's good. I have critical mass. If somebody shows up in a bad mood, you know, they don't want to play, be cooperative that day, the, you know, the culture is going to say, nope, that's who we are. This is how we play you know, this is, this is our culture. Below 60%, I can't, you know, then I start to say, can I actually take a vote? If I got those 10 people in the room and said, is it good here? I'm not sure I could actually win that vote. So I'm concerned under 60%. I'm very happy above 80%. I have a stable culture. I can reinforce. I can drive improvement. And then between 60 and 80, I have significant opportunity. If you think about it, 10 point gain over a period of time, usually those, those uh, sampling periods are about every 12 months to really measure culture in a way that you're using it to drive improvement. Though, it, though in units we're working intensively in, we can actually do text sampling or much more frequent because we really want to know that we're moving the bar. So, so these are the same hospitals by clinical unit. And what you can clearly see in this is, is now we have tremendous variation. And when I look at a broad organization of clinical units, I'm, my eye immediately goes to the upper right-hand corner. 
and I say, who are my high-performing units? What can I learn from them? What do I know about them? Can I partner units in the upper right-hand corner with partners in the, in the lower left-hand corner? So these are the exemplars, right? These are, this is kind of you know, where we're going to learn in the organization, drive, drive improvements, drive best practices, et cetera. If I then go down to the lower left-hand corner, and I'm, you know, I'm immediately, what do I know about these people? Are these inherently high-risk areas? Are these intensive care units? Are these operating rooms? Are these, you know, emergency departments? And, and again, because I can't, because we're so busy, we can't focus on it all at once, it now allows me to look broadly and then say, you know, what are the strengths I can leverage from my upper right-hand corner and what, that, what is that select list of people down on the lower left that I need to intervene, that I need, that need some attention now? Because it's not healthy for them, and frankly, the risk of something bad happening there is pretty substantial. You can look across, you can benchmark, whether it's teamwork or safety climate, job satisfaction, stress recognition, which I don't believe is on the AC, the current AC, survey, what, what that means in English is what is our awareness around susceptibility uh, to make mistakes when we're tired, when we're, you know, task overloaded, when we're working with people we don't know, we're having clinical emergencies, et cetera. But if we take the upper left here and we look at teamwork climate, we have four basic quartiles. And again, this is an organization that has opportunity. Because if you think about it, you'd like those colors to match up perfectly with the line. And what you'd really like is the green to be a big chunk of this graph. But if we look at teamwork climate down in that lower quartile, we've got a lot more units that under 60% that frankly uh, need some improvement. So that allows us to look broadly and say, what are the themes across the organization or, or hospital and then we can start to think about digging down some units. Let me show you a couple units. I'm going to show you um, a unit that needs some help, and then I'm going to show you a unit uh, where you and I would want to work and have our children taken care of. Now, <clears throat> what we don't have in this, but, but again, think about we've looked broadly across some organization, then we've drilled into units, and what do we really want to do? We want to drill down into what does it feel like specifically to those caregivers? What does it feel like when they walk into that clinical unit? Here we, here we have a surgical team. Um, maybe it's a reflection that the culture isn't wonderful. Uh, they weren't able to capture the surgeons. And one of the things that's really important is to understand the discrepancies, how different people see those care environments. And, it, and for example, the scores are generally pretty low. Look at the scrub nurses. I've got one in three rating teamwork positively. And look at the differential between the anesthesiologists and the nurses. And, and again, if you take this data into the room and show it to them in a quiet, respectful way, you can hear a pin drop. Because again, right, what is critical here? Dis now we're drilling down into specific questions. Disagreements in this work setting are resolved appropriately not who's right and who's wrong, what's best for the patient. You know, three-quarters of the anesthesiologists say yes, one in five circulating nurses in this operating room. And again, you know, I always approach it. You're good, skilled people. You want to do the right thing. What are the simple things that are getting in the way of this? What are the simple things we can do to make this better? The culture makes it easy, you know, to learn from the errors of others. And the answer is really not yet. I mean, roughly half the people are agreeing with that. Humans in complex systems will make mistakes. The ability to identify those mistakes, to put in systems, to work collaboratively to fix them is the hallmark of a safe culture. So let's go to a little happier unit here, right? Inpatient pediatric service, teamwork climate. Look at the perceptions of the nurses, the physicians, the residents, the consultants <clears throat> in this you know, 90 to 100 percent. Now again, we've got three, you know, got two-thirds of the nurses saying nurse, nurse inputs are all received. Obviously the physicians see that much more positively. So that opens the door for conversation. 
And that's really the power of unit level data is to be able to say, here's what you said, what are the simple things we can do to make this better. Physicians and nurses work well here as a well-coordinated team. Yes, they do. The mom test, I feel safe being treated as a patient. Absolutely. Now again, I'm going to tease out the nurses because I've got three out of four agreeing with that, but I don't have four out of four agreeing. And it's, you know, what are those simple things that get in the way? What keeps you awake at night? What do you think could be better here, right? It's all about learning. I'm encouraged to report safety concerns. Yes, they are. 100% of the physicians, now again, a little opportunity with the nurses there. So it's all about improvement. One of the things you can do is you can actually map by color units within a hospital. Now this is what's called a heat map. White is good, red is bad. And again, now we're looking across several units in a real hospital. And what we find is we find one unit that has 299 that has, you know, exceptional scores that they could take care of me, they could take care of you. And then we find three or four units at the bottom, which are frankly quite problematic. And, it, and so it allows us to both be think broadly and be strategic about driving improvement in the organization. But now I can get tactical. And now I can say, look, you know, I can go to them. I said, look, you guys are really standing out in the crowd here. So the good news is we have some pretty fundamental opportunity. So <clears throat> let me see. Right. Oh, there we go. For some reason, my computer froze there for a minute. Another moment of magic here. So let me show you the data. Uh, spend a little time showing you some of the data that starts to link uh, debriefing and culture to actual clinical improvement. What you're seeing here is you're seeing um, uh, the aggregate safety culture from 103 intensive care units across the state of Michigan. This, was, this is before the Keystone Project, putting in a central line bundle across the entire state. And, and you know, what's not well publicized in this is that every one of these 103 ICUs had a nurse-physician partnership as leaders so that if, that if a physician was not following the checklist, doing the simple things, they decided when they were putting a central line the, nurse was, the nurses in the unit are required to stop the physician during the insertion. And we all know that's not going to happen unless, unless there's a very clear leadership structure that's going to show up in about five minutes and say, you know, Leonard, you know better than this. Knock it off. Now, this is prospective data. Every one of these lines is the aggregate perception. And again, we could drill it down to various caregivers, and it was. But here, every one of those lines is the aggregate perceptions of everybody who works in that intensive care unit. Unit secretaries, techs, nurses, respiratory, pharmacy, the nurses, the physicians, et cetera. And you can see that it ranges from roughly 15% of the people in that unit rating teamwork positively, which means a considerably higher number does not, to roughly 90%. And and again, then you ask a question and say, well, the goal of this project was no bloodstream infections for five or more months in a year. And is there any difference among these different cultures in the ability to actually work collaboratively and do this? When you break this distribution into thirds or terciles, the upper third, 44% of those units were able to achieve five or more months without an infection. And you get to the lower left-hand corner only one in five or 21 percent can. So what I would argue to you that I feel actually quite strongly is unless you have a strong collaborative culture, it's very hard to get agreement on how you're going to deliver care, i.e. consistent, reliable care. And as an importantly, it's very hard to resolve differences of opinion or conflict to get to agreement on what's best for the patient. The strongest predictor of clinical excellence was caregivers felt comfortable speaking up if they perceived a problem with patient care. So let me show you kind of the impact of bringing leadership into this. 
So here we have, what I'm showing you is I'm showing you an intensive care, a critical care collaborative that's now in year four, year five, excuse me. And what you can see is that the, the safety culture scores really did not budge until year five. And what actually occurred in year five is they started debriefing the results. They would go back to the units. They would say, here's what you said. Here's what we learned. Now we want you to talk about selecting one or two things you can work on, and let's drive that forward. So a little bit of a complicated slide. The green is basically the units going in the right direction, the ones that actually used a debriefing mechanism. And you can see what happened in the changes in their score. The orange were the ones who were basically business as usual that actually did not go the right direction, in fact, went backwards. If you look at the outcome across these 20-some intensive care units, what you see is the, is the critical care units that looked at their data, reflected, identified a very short list of things to work on, literally starting with what's the one thing we want to work on to make it better here. They increased their safety culture scores broadly. They, they basically improved clinical care in terms of BSIs and VAP rates. And sadly, the, organ, the, the units that did not, frankly, uh, sadly went the wrong direction. I can show you organizations like Maine Medical. What you see in the in the kind of the lighter purple was year one. What you see in the dark blue is year two. That when organizations systematically measure culture and drive improvements because they they targeted, they selected out the units, the clinical areas that were weak, that had opportunity, they went in, they engaged leadership around the very specific initiatives. And you can see that they pretty systematically raised the bar. You can also drive improvement through walk rounds. So what you see here is the darker brown lines are units after walk rounds. What are the, the shall we say, the uh, lighter lines are pre. And if you look down in kind of the left-hand corner of this, what you'll see is the lower units that, that had more opportunity you could frankly drive pretty substantial improvements in those units by engaging frontline leaders. So what is that? That's basically, here's how you close the cycle. We go and measure, we get unit level data, we can drive it down, we can engage people in those units, have them debrief their own data, right? Here's where you're strong, here's where you're weak, grab opportunity, pick one thing that would make it better here, that would help you improve care, who's gonna do what by when. All that data can be tracked. It can be tracked electronically in some of the work we do. It can be tracked on paper. But now I can link, I can link senior leaders in the organization that when they do walk rounds on those units focused on safety, it's not you know the meet and greet, how are you, nice to see you. They can walk in and say, I know what you're working on. I know it's important. You've done great work. How can we help you? How can we reinforce that work? couple quick slides, and then I want to open it to discussion. So you can use the debriefer. This is a, a, a tool that was published in the Joint Commission Journal by uh, Brian Sexton and Lori Payne. And what you do in this is you basically, again, ask a few questions. What item of particular concern or relevance to us? Why is it important to us? Envision an ideal unit. My version of this is getting into a room and saying, think about what optimal care would look like, does look like in your unit. Now take five or ten minutes, talk to, to each other, and list out the things that get in the way of that today. What gets in the way of optimal care? You'll get an extensive list and say, okay, we have some low-hanging fruit. we got some stuff that's more complicated, some stuff very complicated. Where are we going to take that bite of the elephant? Where are we going to get started? What's the one actual step? toward an ideal unit. And again, you look at a debriefer tool, you know, we generate these out of our group off, off a web-based platform that allows people to really slice and dice and manipulate their data. They print it. One side of the paper is least positive item scores. This is what you said. Here's where you're weak or have opportunity. Here's where you're strong. The other side of that is 
you know, after you talk about it, what was the one thing you want to work on? Why was it important? Give me some specific examples. And then basically creates that accountability to say who, what, by when, how are we going to measure, how are we going to drive improvement, and then frankly, how are we going to link leadership into that conversation. All right, so what I've attempted to do is kind of give you a broad overview. Why is safety culture important? How do we think about it? How do we look at it? Look broadly, but be able to drill it down to individual units, perceptions among specific caregivers, because that's where culture lives, and then make that data actionable. So um, and I think we were gearing for 25 minutes, and I went 27 or 28, so that's uh, moderate self-control on the Leonard front, and I'll, uh, I'll stop talking and see if you guys have any questions or thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. I think that's a really amazing presentation for a couple of reasons. Um, certainly, you, you zeroed in on the need to measure at the clinical unit level, and I think what is kind of very thought-provoking is actually the, where you've ended on the debriefer tool, because part of the challenge that um, a lot of uh, organizations face is that because culture sometimes seems a little bit uh, less than tangible, um, it's like, well, it is what it is and you don't know how to even start to, to take the bite out of the elephant and, and break it down and start to action what you could do to improve. So not only have you given us a way to measure something that's a little bit less than tangible, but you've actually given us something that we can actually consider how we can implement because then you can uh, move some of these changes forward. Um, what I'd like to do for our listener audience is to flag for them how they can participate in the next step of the call where we can get into a conversation with Dr. Leonard. So if um, participants have had the opportunity, I believe when you logged on, to uh, use an audio PIN or um, identification number, and what you can do is you can actually raise a question or raise your hand on the system. Um, Lisa, is there anything in particular that we need to advise our listener group out there in order to be able to participate? Uh, no, people can either type in. Come back on there. Uh, people can either uh, type in their question or they can raise their hand. And they can raise their hand uh, by clicking the icon beside their name. Okay. Let me um, just speak to, speak to something while we're while we're waiting for folks. Um, we did talk. Um, those of us who kind of organized this call um, last week about the fact that we do have, um, and again, because I know the survey data you you all have. Um, <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? I just yeah, I got the yep. kind of the, the pink yeah. flash screen. Uh, absolutely. But we do we do we do have a um, a little open source website, opensafety.org, um, that allow would allow a unit to go on and if they were going to work on something specifically and actually measure their safety culture um, for no money. Now we you know we I do this as part of a a safety consulting group and and um, you know this this is primarily the work I do these days but we also did want to afford um, an open source website that we all <clears throat> have huge great intentions of spending more time developing but have been busy but there is the capability if a team wanted to work on a specific project um, that they could go on and actually do unit level cultural measurement since I know that uh, capability does not exist today with, with the way Accreditation Canada is, is measuring culture for you guys. So for the uh, listener group, we did share the Accreditation Canada um, Patient Safety Culture Survey sample with Dr. Leonard, and, and certainly um, he has acknowledged that, and as we all know, that it's very much a a high-level organizational snapshot, and it doesn't give you quite the ability to drill down as he, as Dr. Leonard has identified in his presentation. So, if you look at um, the Open Safety uh, website, it um, allows you to uh, I, um, work with your with a particular team and choose a uh, 
a questionnaire that you could actually start to drill down at the unit level. It's, it's a fantastic piece of work, and I encourage you to actually look at it. Um, uh, Lisa, do we have any questions out from the floor? No, we have a very quiet audience today. There doesn't seem to be any questions, but if anybody has any other comments or uh, any other experiences that they'd like to share. Michael, it, it's Elaine, and, and uh, it's Elaine Orbein, and, and again, a huge thank you for, for just a fantastic presentation. I'm sure people are going to, going to, uh, going to jump in shortly. Um, the challenges, you, you, you spoke of, of many of the challenges of, of um, well, moving, moving that culture um, forward or changing culture. And, and I think that underpins some of the most difficult challenges that we all face. Can you add a little bit more in terms of some of the practical strategies? You know, you talked about the, the situation where the nurse is expected to, to speak up in terms, you know, in, in terms of, of alerting the physician that no, you know, you're, you're, it's not being done properly or or this is what needs to be done at this point in time. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I really believe that, among others, that that really is a huge challenge that um, that many online today and 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 many of our colleagues across the country really face. Yeah, it, it's there are a couple pieces to this, and and this is why leadership is is so critical in this. Where where the so again, if you think about where we started the conversation, I spent a few minutes kind of framing to say what are the pieces of the puzzle. And the pieces of the puzzle, you know, any whether I go into a hospital, whether I go into a health system, or whether I go into a clinical unit, I'm always running that little checklist in my head to say <clears throat> what leadership exists, right, both broadly at a senior level and clinically in this unit because that's critical for success. And I really need physician leaders. I need physician leaders who are willing to, you know, once, I mean, truly exceptional organizations and units. If we use, for example, Mayo Clinic example from the United States, they're very clear about the acceptable behaviors, the behaviors that, that create value in the organization, they're very clear about the behaviors that are unacceptable, which is abusive, disrespectful behavior, or if you're doing something at Mayo and it is not in the best interest of the patient, you have a fundamental problem. And so I think about what is the leadership in this unit. I can take their cultural data back to them. Now, when I get into really, you know, units that are pretty dysfunctional, and, and I've gone into big surgical service lines where, you know, 30, 40, 50 operating theaters, and you get in a room with two or 300 people, 80 or 90 percent of the surgeons and anesthesiologists think nursing inputs well received, and 20 percent of the nurses in the operating room. And, and you put that data up, you can hear a pin drop in the room. Right. Because, because when, what you want when you look at culture, if I go into a unit, you know, you, you want everybody to have very strong perceptions of those relationships because that's fundamentally what we're talking about is relationships and you want them to be concordant or the same. When you walk in and the doctors think everything's great and nobody else does, it's dangerous. And, and even if I have resistant physicians, I can say, you know, not only does this put the patient at risk, this puts you at risk. What do you think the chance that that nurse is going to raise their hand and tell you you're making a mistake or you're doing a wrong side operation? Those are the kind of cultures where somebody says we're missing a sponge or an instrument in an operating room, and the surgeon says, well, just find it and continues to close the patient. Right. And so, so what's key is kind of linking that 